Barbizon reaches the stop code on, it has to pause for a sec. And well, if you have a cestus element, you can get it to pause for a sec, as in a selenocysteine. So selenocysteine is the 21st amino acid. I know we typically talk about there being 20 amino acids or protein letters, um, but the reason why we don't talk about selenocysteine that much is that it's really rare. There's only like 20 or so proteins in our body that use it, but these proteins are really, really important. They're doing important roles in serving as like antioxidants. So preventing like things like hydrogen peroxide from causing damage. So we have like glutathione peroxide, um, peroxidase that actually relies on the selenium in selenocysteine. Um, and then we have thyroredoxin reductase, which is going to help um, reverse unwanted like crosslinks between proteins. And so these important proteins are able to serve these roles because they have selenocysteine. And selenocysteine, what's special about it is it has selenium. And so selenium is one of the elements. So we when we're talking about like carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, all those normal elements, well, selenium is one of the like kind of like abnormal ones in terms of what you would normally find in the body. As I'll talk about, because it's really reactive, our bodies have to like chaperone it and like keep it really protected. Um, but then they incorporate it in specific positions in proteins to play important roles where they take advantage of selenium's properties of that reactivity, of the, not just the reactivity, but kind of like the reversibility of this reactivity. So I'll talk a lot more about this, but selenium is like sulfur on steroids. And I'll get more into this, but basically sulfur is a kind of more reactive and weaker bond forming version of oxygen and then selenium is like even more so. So selenium is going to have this like big electron cloud. So it's gonna form these kind of like weak bonds um, and it's going to be more reactive as like a nucleophile. And so it's going to like make and break bonds more easily than a sulfur or than an oxygen. So it's actually able to break up sulfur, 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 sulfur bonds um, and things like this. And so it's able to play really important roles. Um, and so we'll get more into all of this and why, but first we need to talk about how we actually get the selenium into proteins because it has to go through this like trickery. It tricks the ribosome or the protein making machinery into putting a selenocysteine in in place of like a stop codon. So normally a stop codon is the instructions that tells the ribosome that, hey, we stopped making the protein. And then this thing called the release factor binds and cuts off the, um, the, the partial protein, that like the finished protein product. But in this case, the protein product Product isn't finished and so what happens is that it kind of like sneaks in there's like a, a loopy part in the RNA in the instructions like downstream in the part that doesn't even have protein making machine instructions and it's kind of gonna bind to the stuff to get the to get the selenocysteine ready like all the machinery it needs to sneak in there and then when the ribosome pauses waiting for that release factor wow now the selenium is going to sneak back in and so we'll talk more about this um, as well as some of the proteins that use selenocysteine um, and why these why selenium is able to give it all these properties and so that was just like a whirlwind overview and now let's dive in and talk in a little more detail so we have 20 common genetically encoded proteinogenic amino acids. So yeah, so it's easier to just say we have 20 amino acids, but we really have um, this extra one. And this extra one, however, it's going to be really rare and it has to get inserted in this special way. Um, and in, what happens is that it kind of gets modified. The tRNA gets modified after it's loaded. Um, but before it gets inserted into a protein. And we'll get much more about this, but this is just like a little technical detail that makes it so that some people don't think it counts. Um, but basically what it what it, we mean by coded is that in the instructions for making a protein, the um, the there are three letter codes, um, three letter combos called codons. And basically these codons are going to tell the ribosome, so the protein making machinery, which amino acid to add. And then what's going to happen is that these other molecules called, called tRNAs, what they're going to do is they're going to come and they're going to bring the corresponding amino acid. So in your messenger RNA, in the RNA copy of the protein recipe, there's going to be a codon. So that's going to say, okay, we'll add this amino acid. So if you had like a UGU, you would add a cysteine. And then the ribosome, there's a tRNA that's going to come and it's going to bring in the corresponding amino acid. So in this case, it would bring a cysteine. Um, and so the, the ribosome does this until it reaches a stop codon. And so the stop codon, instead of spelling for an amino acid, it tells the ribosome to stop. 
And so what's going to happen is that when the ribosome will has to pause for a second, and then when it's paused, a release factor is going to come in. And this release factor looks like a tRNA kind of, but it's a protein. And it has it's able to catalyze or promotes, um, speed up the cleavage of this peptide. So you've been adding all these amino acids together to form this chain that's going to fold up to form your protein. And once you get to the end, you need to cut off the chain. And so this chain is going to be cut off by this release factor. And so the release factor is going to come and it's going to bind and it's um, to this to this A site, the place where the, normally the new tRNA would come in, um, but it's going to come and it's going to cleave off the peptide. What happens in the case of selenocysteine is that in order to incorporate the selenocysteine, there's going to be a special element in the RNA. So the messenger RNA is like the RNA copy of the DNA version of a gene. Um, and so the instructions for making a protein, we typically think about, um, we can talk about like the coding region, those ones that code for the different amino acids. So basically they have those codons in them and they're telling the ribosome, okay, put amino acids here, 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 here. What happens in the case of this messenger RNA is that it actually gets edited before it gets to the ribosome. And so in the gene version of it that this RNA is a copy of, there is extra information. So there's some regulatory information. And the regulatory information that's between the different parts that actually have the codon, so between the different exons, there's regulatory information that gets sliced out, spiced out. Um, but there's also some regulatory information at the ends that stays on. And so we call these the untranslated regions because they're not translated, they're not converted into, made into a protein. So we call that process of the ribosome going on along the messenger RNA and piecing together these amino acids, we call that translation. And so these version, these ends are these five prime and three prime untranslated regions. And so five prime and three prime, these are just kind of like how we refer to the ends of, of mRNA or of, um, of RNA or DNA. So we often um, don't pay that much attention to these, but maybe we should pay more attention because they're really important. Um, they can help influence when the protein is made um, from this messenger RNA. And they can also, in the case of selenocysteine, it can influence the actual sequence that gets made in the protein. Because what happens in the case of selenocysteine is that downstream, so Further after the, like af at the end, after the end of the actual protein, you have this thing called the cestus element. And what it's going to do is it's going to basically say, okay, well here we have, it's going to have this like loopy bit of, loopy bit of RNA. And so RNA can kind of like fold up and make these shapes, even though we typically like you, I typically draw it as like a straight line. RNA is actually really, really loopy and it can actually form these like complex structures and things like ribosomes. Although there's also some proteins in ribosomes. Um, but basically RNA can fold up into all these structures and then these structures can sometimes bind things. Um, and just like different proteins can bind different things specifically, um, you can have RNA structures bind things specifically. In the case of selenocysteine, we have this selenocysteine insertion sequence. Um, and basically what this is, is, is it's a sequence in the three prime UTR. So in that part without, that's like downstream of the gene or downstream of the protein making instructions, it loops up and it loops up in a shape that's going to bind to this protein called SVP2. Um, and this is going to help recruit a tRNA that's loaded with selenocysteine, um, as well as an elongation factor. So a kind of helper molecule or chaperone that's going to take this tRNA that's loaded with that selenocysteine and take it and insert it here. And it has to do this so it's nearby where that selenocysteine is going to get incorporated. And so it's able to kind of keep things in, keep things close by so that before that release factor can get in there, this can sneak in there. And so it has to be quick. So it has to be close. Um, and so this cestus element is able to keep it close. And then when the ribosome reaches that stop codon, normally it would, it would just put the release factor would come. But if you have a selenoprotein, if you have protein that has one of these elements that's telling the ribosome, hey, this isn't really a stop codon. We want a selenocysteine here. Well, now you're going to have all that stuff that you need to insert the selenocysteine into the protein. And we'll talk more in a minute about how we actually prepare, how our cells make this, make this tRNA in the first place. Um, and so, but basically, 
it's going to involve having that tRNA. Um, it actually gets loaded first with serine, um, or it actually, yeah, it gets loaded with serine um, using the amino acid transferase um, that trans that normally loads the serine onto a tRNA. Um, so serine is like cysteine and it's like selenocysteine, but it has an OH, it has a hydroxyl group instead of a thiol group with, in the case of cysteine or a selenyl group in the case of selenocysteine. And then this serine is going to get phosphorylated um, to kind of like activate it. And then it's going to get changed into a selenocysteine. So you're going to kind of swap out the oxygen for a selenium. Um, and now this tRNA is ready to go. So this is what I was referring to when some people say it like doesn't really count as one of those um, amino acid, genetically encoded proteinogenic amino acids or whatever, um, because the tRNA actually gets modified at like it gets loaded and then the tRNA gets modified. Um, but this is all happening before it gets into the protein. So that's an important distinction is that this is not a post-translational modification. So we've talked about how some of the amino acids allow allow the proteins to have modifications after the fact. So post-translationally, so after the ribosome pieces of those amino acids together, that some of them can get modified. And so you can see things like phosphorylation to get like phosphoserine. Um, and we can get things like methylation and acetylation of lysine and hydroxylation of proline um, and various things like these. This is changing the this is changing the amino acid after it's added into the protein. In the case of selenocysteine, we're just changing it after it's added to the tRNA, but before it gets added to the protein. So it's still going to be um, still it's not a post-translational modification. It is incorporated into the protein as selenocysteine. But this is only going to happen if you have that cesis element. Um, and it's only going to happen, like a gene would only have that if it needed a selenocysteine. And so selenocysteine, as we'll talk about, it has these properties that are going to make it so that it's really good for certain roles. And these certain roles include when you want to make and um, you want to make and break bonds. You want to be able to kind of like make reversible bonds. And you want to deal with redox, so reduction and oxidation, which I'll talk about more, more in a minute. But basically, you can have cysteine get oxidized and form like cross links where multiple cysteines are bound to one, like two cysteines are kind of linked up. And this can cause problems if you don't want this to happen. Or if you do want this to happen, you just need to make sure you do it in a controlled manner. And so our cells have ways to do that too. But this can happen if you have reactive oxygen species. So things like hydrogen peroxide or superoxide, various different reactive oxygens. And what those reactive oxygens can do is they can kind of attack things like proteins and DNA and kind of um, cause problems. And they can cause problems if they cause the cysteine to form these crosslinks that you don't want. And so one of the um, some of the proteins in your cells are things that are able to serve as in order to break these up, and they're able to break these up by using selenocysteine, because when you form a bond to selenocysteine, it's easier to break off. And so not only is selenocysteine able to kind of help sop up some of the some of the reactive oxygen species by taking the taking the brunt of the hit instead of the cysteine instead of the DNA, um, because this when you have it to a sulfur selenium, it's going to be easier to remove, um, and so it can kind of take the hit and it, and instead of these other more um, more vulnerable um, more vulnerable molecules. And we can get these selenocysteine um, links that are like a selenothiol link. Um, so basically both of these are kind of linked together and these are going to be easier to break off. And so this is going to be important when we see it serve in various roles. And we'll talk more about why selenocysteine is so good at that. So some of the, the key selenoproteins in your body. So there's like 25 that we know about. Um, we call these like selenoproteins. We have about like 20,000 different proteins in total, but only like 25 of these actually have selenium. So it's really rare, um, but it's, but selenium, when these, these proteins that do have it are really, really important. And so the first ones that were discovered were like these glutathione peroxidases. Um, and these are one of the first lines of defense about, against oxidative stress. Um, and so they catalyze, they like speed up the, reduction of hydrogen peroxide, we'll talk more about this, and lipid peroxides to water and lipid alcohols with the help of glutathione. And so basically it's able to take the, take the, take 
this hydrogen peroxide, which if we don't control it, what it can do is it can kind of split up and it forms these radicals where you have these lone electrons. Um, and so basically just know that these radicals are really, really reactive and they can kind of set off these chain reactions and you don't want that happening. And so you want to keep that prevent that hydrogen peroxide from splitting in that weird way where you kind of break things off with one electron on each and you want to break it up in so that it forms water. And the way that you're able to do this is using glutathione peroxidase, which relies on having a selenium, a selenocysteine. Um, and the selenocysteine, well, it's going to take the hit, it's going to get oxidized, um, and then it's going to now get restored by glutathione. And so glutathione, we've talked about it before. It's kind of like what your cells use to kind of keep a reducing environment. And we'll talk more about oxidation and reduction. Um, but basically when we have like the for cysteine, the oxidized form is when it's forming these disulfide bonds. Um, and then we can, the reduced form is when they're free. And so with glutathione, it can kind of get oxidized, form these like two of the glutathions linking up through this disulfide bond. And then it can get reduced where those um, glutathions split up. And so there are other proteins that are going to help um, restore this oxidized glutathione to a non-oxidized form. But the glutathione here, it's going to bring this seleno, um, this selenosulfide bond is going to be able to break that up. Um, and so it's going, and it's going to be able to break off the water and then break this up. And so glute, but the selenocysteine is able to do this and make it so that you're able to more easily break the, break this bond up than if you had like sulfur bonds. And this is going to be more reactive. It's going to be able to react with that hydrogen peroxide more easily than a cysteine would. And we'll get into why this is. Another key selenoprotein or family of selenoproteins are thyroredoxin reductases. So they work with this little, these little proteins called thyroredoxin, and they're going to basically serve to break up the, the disulfide bonds that form, in, unwanted disulfide bonds that form. Um, so like we're talking about in the case where you can have these cysteines that are like in different places of proteins or in different proteins that can kind of like link together if there's reactive oxygen around. And so your cells have ways in order to, um, to reduce those crosslinks, to break them up. And one of the ways that they do this is with thyroidoxin. And so thyroidoxin is going to be a protein that is able to act in order to it does this like thiol disulfide exchange reactions. So basically this is showing you DTT, but in thyroidoxin, you basically have a protein instead of the small molecule where you have two of these sulfurs. And so in their reduced form, they're able to break up this, this um, cysteine bond, this crosslink. And so they're able to break it up and then they become um, crosslinked themselves. And so you go from having the reduced form of thyroidoxin where you have two sulfur groups free floating or not free floating, but I mean like not connected. And then what happens is that when it gets oxidized, so it then reduces these disulfide bonds that are already formed and becomes oxidized in the process. So those it forms a disulfide bond on itself in exchange for breaking up the disulfide bond in the protein. But now something needs to break up the disulfide bonds on the thyroredoxin. And so this is where thyroredoxin reductase comes in. And thyroredoxin reductase is going to do something similar, but it's going to be using a selenium. And so thyroredoxin reductase is one of the key selenium containing proteins or selenoproteins. And it's able to break up disulfide bonds using a selenium. And so this is a similar way to what we see with the thyroredoxin doing. But here, because we're using selenium, it's going to be easier to um, break the, that bond up and it's going to be easier to re-break the bond that you formed to the selenium. Um, so basically it's going to make it so that you're forming these, you're breaking up the crosslinks and making it so that you can more easily um, regenerate things. Um, and so selenium plays a key role there. And then there's also iodothyronine, the iodinases, um, which are involved in making thyroid hormones. And so thyroid hormones are talking about weird elements that we see in the body. Um, we don't see iodine that much, but we do see them in our thyroid hormones. And in order to kind of like remove iodines, um, your cells use selenoproteins, um, these iodothyronine iodothyronine deiodinases. Um, so removing those iodines, um, that's a real mouthful. And there's also um, some that are involved in 
removing uh, methionine oxidase, uh, oxidized methionine. Okay, so those are where we're going to see it in proteins, but we and we still need to figure out how we're actually going to get that tRNA loaded. We saw how we get that tRNA into the protein, but how do we actually get the seleno the selenium into the protein? Um, and this is, or the selenium into the tRNA. And this is an issue because, well, selenium needs supervision. So it's one of those really reactive, um, reactive atoms, which is what makes it so useful. But if you have something that's really reactive, you don't want it just like all over the place, um, uncontrolled. And so similarly with some metals like copper, like we don't want them just like hanging out all, the, all over the place and like causing reactions to happen. Um, and so with these elements, we keep them chaperoned. And in the case of seleno, um, selenium, what we do is we keep it stored in a protein. So this seleno, pro most times when a protein is a seleno protein, so if it has a selenium, it normally just has like one. But there's this is protein called selenoprotein P or cell P, and it has 10 selen um, selenocysteines. And so what this means is it can kind of like store as serve as like a store of it, of it like a stock house of, of selenium. Um, and therefore, if you need selenium, then you can break it down. And then when you break it down, it can get used and put into a protein and put into the tRNA, which again gets put into the protein and you kind of break it down and use it fresh. And so, but overall the pathway, you, we can see we have this kind of difficult pathway in order to get that selenium into that tRNA. So remember that we are starting with we have a tRNA and it's specific for selenocysteine. However, it gets loaded with a serine. So you can sometimes the naming when you see it gets really confusing because what's going to happen is it's going to get loaded with a serine, even though this tRNA's anticodon is going to match the, um, the UGA. It's going to match the sequence, um, the codon for selenocysteine. It's first going to get loaded with a serine. And it's going to get loaded with a serine using the same machinery that loads normal amino, that loads the serine amino acid with a serine. Um, and so when we talk about this loading, what we're talking about is these amino acid tRNA synthetases or these AARSs. Um, and so they're responsible for kind of like activating the amino acid and then linking it up to the tRNA. And I talk much more about this in another post, but you can see that it requires ATP. Um, it's like an energy dependent process because you want to, you're kind of investing and you want to make sure that you're putting the right amino acid onto the right tRNA. Even though in this case, what we're putting is a weird, is not the amino acid that we finally want, but it's the original one that we're going to put on. Speaking of ATP, you see a lot of ATP um, in this pathway. We're going to see a couple of several ATPs. And this is because this is going to be, you have to invest a lot in making this selenocysteine. We've got to really bribe it to make this. Um, just like we have to bribe the ribosome to put it in, we have to bribe this um, tRNA machinery um, in order to get the amino acid modified. And the way you bribe things in biochemistry and your body is typically using ATP, which is kind of like your cellular energy currency. Um, and so basically in ATP, you have these three negatively charged phosphate groups that are really close together, kind of like, and you're kind of clamping them together like a clamp spring. This is going to make them really like high energy. So basically if we were to break this, we would get a lot of energy. Be just like if you were to unclamp a spring, you would have the spring like fly out. And if you put something on the end of the spring, then that thing would fly out. So in biochemistry, a similar sort of thing with ATP, but instead of like flinging ping pong balls across the room, we're helping get reactions to happen that might not be that favorable. And so if that happened, we see that we'll see that several cases times in the making of the selenocysteine and the loading of this tRNA. So we see that we loaded it with serine. And so now we have this serine loaded tRNA sec. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're actually going to phosphorylate it. Ultimately, what we want to do is we want to swap off this oxygen for a selenium. So we want to make take this hydroxyl group and make it a selenyl group. Um, and by doing so, what we're but in order to do so, we need to kind of like activate this, make it so that it'll be more reactive. Um, and so we can make it more reactive by phosphorylating it. This is a common theme you'll see in biochemistry is if you want something to react somewhere, add a phosphate onto it. Um, this phosphate, it's going to be a nice leaving group and stuff, so it'll be happy to leave. 
um, and it'll make things vulnerable to attack. So we get this phosphorylation or the addition of one of these phosphate groups onto the onto the serine. So we've seen serine be modified in proteins, but now we're seeing serine get phosphorylated before it even gets into a protein. Um, but before it gets into a protein, it, that phosphate group is going to be removed. And so it's going to get removed and swapped out for selenium. Um, and so the selenium is also going to be added in this like in an activated, it's also going to get like transported in an activated form. And so when we have that selenium, so we have that selenoprotein, that cell P that we talked about, which is kind of like going to be your storage system for your selenium. Um, and so cell P, like there's actually like 40 to 50% of the selenium in your blood plasma. So when like the cellulose cell is part of your blood is, is housed in the seleno cell P. And then what happens is that if, when your cell is ready to make a protein, it's ready to make tRNA that needs the selenium, what it can do is it can degrade that, um, degrade that cell P protein um, using this um, selenosis. So selenocysteine lyase, um, and so what you're going to end up with is this SE2 minus, um, and then there's another protein, selenophosphate synthetase, um, SBS2. So this guy, what he's going to do is he's going to combine it with ATP to make selenophosphate. And then it's this selenophosphate that's going to be used by this sepsexs, sepsexs, um, which is going to then make it so that it's going to swap out that that, ox that oxygen-containing phosphate group, um, it's going to take that off and add your selenol on there. So then you end up with an SCH on there. And yeah, so there's a lot of abbreviations because some of the full names are just like ridiculous. Like the SEP, um, SEC S, what it is, is it's o phosphoryl tRNA sec selenocysteinol tRNA sec synthase. synthase. Um, so yeah, so abbreviations. For the win. Okay. So speaking of for, for the win, what have we just accomplished? We've taken that tRNA we've, that has the anticodon for selenocysteine. Now what we've done is we have charged it with serine. So we put a serine onto that tRNA. Now what we've done is we phosphorylated that serine so that we make it more reactive and so that we're going to be able to swap in a selenium. And then what we do is, well, we swap in a selenium. And so remember, this is the selenium that's coming from that cell P typ protein typically that you just broke down and then you phosphorylated it and now you we're able to sneak it in. So this whole process in order to just make this tRNA and now we need to actually put it into the protein. And so this is where that cestus element is going to come in. So normally when that when the ribosome reaches the st stop codon, so reaches the UGA, so there's also another couple of stop codons and only one of them is actually going to be able to get tricked into, trick the ribosome into putting in the selenocysteine. Um, but when it gets to a UGA, if there's one of those cestus elements um, downstream, well, now what's going to happen is you have the binding of these of these factors. So we can talk about like cis acting elements and trans acting elements. So something that cis is going to be like on in the same thing as the thing that you're regulating kind of that sounds weird um but basically the cis element would be like something in this rna and so the cis element an example is the cesis and so basically it is in it's that structure that is actually in the rna and so it's on the same thing it's cis then you have trans acting factors and so we have both trans and cis acting factors um, and so in the case of these transacting factors, we have this protein SBB2, which is going to kind of help keep together. We have this tier and recruit and keep nearby the place where to in get inserted this tRNA that we loaded with, with selenocysteine, as well as the special elongation factor, um, this FSEC. So normally when the ribosome's like going along translating things, there are elongation factors that actually come and they transport, they kind of like chaperone the tRNAs to the ribosome and they make sure that the right tRNA is getting added and stuff. And so normally they all use the same elongation factor, but in the case of selenocysteine, you have a special elongation factor. You have this FSA. And this is going to make it so that the you you're, keep all this together um, at this cestus element and then you can sneak it in instead of a release factor. So when it gets, it can pass this UGA and put in a selenocysteine. And then when it gets to an actual stop codon, it will stop. Um, and I just want to note that this is, there are basically two of these weird, uh, uncommon amino acids that I'll talk about, the uncommon genetically encoded ones. 
Um, and so selenocysteine, we have this one. There's this one called pyrolysine that some like bacteria and archaea and stuff have. And they use a different strategy. Um, what they actually do is they kind of, they make the pyrolysine before they load it onto the tRNA. And so we'll look at, we'll look at this in another post. Um, but basically this gets loaded on before the tRNA. I mean, it gets modified and then put on the tRNA. And then it's going to cause this, um, get incorporated out of UAG. And in selenocysteine, we have this get, um, we have it get in modified after it's added to the tRNA, but before it gets added to the protein. Um, and we're relying on the secondary structure on in the RNA as well. And we're going to stop, uh, we're not stop at a UGA. Um, and, but this is only going to happen if you have one of these um, selenoproteins where you have the cestus element and everything has already been pre-made and put in place and everything like that. Okay, so yeah, so that's a lot of work. And so why would we do this? Well, we mentioned how there were some really, really important selen selenium pr containing proteins. And so let's talk about how, why selenium makes these, how the selenium is able to give them this power. So most of the time in biochemistry, we're dealing with just these like main core elements. So we have like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen and, and phosphorus and sulfur. Um, but most of the time we don't, we, yeah, most of the time you deal with like carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, those are like your big four. Um, and, but we can have these other elements can get involved. And when they do get involved, they typically have get involved because they have really cool functions. Um, and this is the case with selenium. And so all of these atom, all of these elements, basically they're characterized by their number of protons. So when you look at a periodic table, the number that's like above the letter, this is going to tell you how many protons they have. And so each of these elements is made up of basic units called atoms. And each of those atoms have smaller parts, subatomic particles. And these are protons, neutrons, and electrons. And the protons are positively charged and they hang out in this dense central core called the nucleus. And they're kind of glued together by these neutrons, which are neutral. Um, and then they're surrounded by these negatively charged electrons. And so when we see these dots, these are representing electrons. And we can draw them as kind of being in these shells. Um, this isn't how they're actually oriented, but we can think about them as kind of being in these shells and this outer shell, these are like the electrons that are farthest from the nucleus. They're farthest from the pull of the protons that positive, um, so you get the protons because they're positive and the electrons because they're negative, you get this attraction between them, but if the electrons are farther away, they're gonna feel that pull less. And so the ones that are on the far, are farthest away, we call these the valence electrons and atoms want to have a full shell typically. And so for example, carbon, it, want, it would need four more in order to get an octet. So a full shell for it would be eight electrons. So it, would, it can form like four bonds to get that. And a nitrogen, it can form three. Well, an oxygen, it can, it can two bonds. And same with sulfur, because sulfur, well, it's right below oxygen on the periodic table. And when, if you go down a column on the periodic table, what you see is that you have the same number of valence electrons. And therefore, elements that are in the same column or the same group they're going to behave similarly, but they're not going to behave identically because you get differences when you're going down the periodic table. Each of these times, you're kind of like adding another layer to your shell. And so when we go from oxygen to sulfur to selenium, we're getting bigger and bigger. And those valence electrons, the ones on the outside, are going to be further and further away from the protons. And why this matters is because that's, it's those valence electrons that are going to be able to be reactive. And so atoms are going to form bonds with one another and they're gonna give and take electrons in order to try to get those that ideal number of electrons. And those electrons that are actually interacting with one another are going to be the valence electrons. Um, and so how atoms are kind of what they're going to do is you can form these covalent bonds. So in a covalent bond, they're sharing pairs of electrons. And these electrons are shared by these atoms kind of overlapping their orbitals. So instead of like shells like this, out, electrons are really like kind of like whizzing around and there's places that there's more likely to be, which we call orbitals. And instead of being in like nice circle, like onion shells like this, um, most of the orbitals are like weird shapes and stuff. Um, but basically those are just representing like if you put a tracer on an electron, where is it more like most likely to hang out in the atom? And so we can define these like orbitals. Now what happens is that these, so these orbitals are these like kind of like parts of the cloud where the electrons hang out more. 
these atoms can kind of overlap their orbitals. And this orbital overlap allows them to share pairs of electrons. And so they can share a single pair of electrons for a single bond or two pairs of electrons for a double bond. Um, and these are covalent bonds. Um, so these aren't just attractions, they're actually like sharing electrons. Um, what happens is that if you have the electrons further out, they're going to be um, less tightly held and they're going to be more reactive. And so if we think about going from, uh, if we think about going from like an oxygen to a sulfur to a selenium, our valence electrons are getting farther away. They're going to feel the pull less. And so they're going to be more loosely held and more reactive. It's also that like, if you're that, if you, Selenium is going to have a lot more protons than a sulfur. So you can see selenium has 34 protons versus sulfur has 16 and oxygen has eight. And um, so in its neutral form, it's also going to have an equal number of electrons. So this would have 34 electrons. And well, if you have like a single electron, like in the case of hydrogen, you're going to notice if you lose that electron. And in fact, if you lose that electron, well, now that's what we call a proton because all it has left is a proton because like at least like the normal version of hydrogen we think about doesn't have a neutron. And so it's just a proton and an electron. And then when you lose that electron, well, now you just left the proton. Um, and so this is what we see when we get like protonation. And we'll talk about this in a second. Um, but basically... If you have uh, these, if you were to lose that electron, you notice that. But if you kind of have this giant cloud of electrons and you lose one or you gain one, well, then you don't notice it that much, right? And so this is why selenium, this is the reason why selenium is able to act as a good redox agent or reducing oxidation. So remember oil rig, oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. And so selenium is able to lose and gain electrons more easily because it's kind of got this like big, um, big cloud with a ton of electrons. And so if you kind of lose or take one, um, it's less of an issue. And so this is why selenium is going to be really good for our redox reactions, what we'll talk about. So we can think about various trends if we look down the periodic table of this in this group. And so the group that we're talking about is going to be what we call these like chaplains. Um, and so basically these are this, this means like oil ore forming. Um, and so basically you can find these like an ore often had like oxygen and stuff like that. But anyway, it's this column, this group. Um, and so basically what happens is that if you go down the column, so we're going from oxygen to sulfur to selenium, what happens is that the elements are getting bigger. And so as we talked about, that kind of makes it so that those valence electrons are going to be more, more loosely held. And this is going to make it so that it's going to be um, more likely to for, to act as a nucleophile. And we'll talk about this um, later, but basically we can think of these electrons as being more reactive, um, as being more willing to kind of go out and try to find a partner. Um, but we're also going to have it so that because these are, they have these big orbitals, it's kind of going to be awkward for them to form bonds. And when they form these bonds, they're going to be weaker. And so these, you can think of it kind of like someone with a really, like a giant trying to shake hands with a baby. It's going to be really awkward to try to grip them. When selenium forms bonds with other smaller atoms, it's going to be harder for them to like kind of overlap those orbitals. And so you're going to get these weaker bonds formed. And if you have a weaker bond formed, it's going to be easier to break. Um, and so it's going to be easier to make bonds to, sel to selenium, but it's also going to be able to be easier to break those bonds to selenium. And some of these weaker bonds are, well, to protons. Um, and so what's actually going to happen is that selenium is going to be, have a much, it's going to be much more acidic. It's going to have a lower pKa. Basically, you're, it's a lot easier to find it in this selenate form. So all three of these, when we talk about serine, cysteine, and selenocysteine, these all have groups, um, these all have groups on their ends that can kind of deprotonate. So we have a hydroxyl group and it can deprotonate, lose a proton to become a hydroxylate. You have a sulfhydryl group, we sometimes call a thiol group. This can deprotonate to form a thiolate. And you have a selenyl group, which can deprotonate to form a selenate. Um, and what happens is that it's a lot easier to deprotonate a selenocysteine than it is to deprotonate a serine. So we can say when something deprotonates, when something gives up a proton, we say that it acts as an acid. And if something takes a proton, it acts as a base. So we can say that selenocysteine is more acidic than cysteine and more acidic than serine. And selenocysteine is in fact so acidic that normally in our bodies, it's going to predominate in this negatively charged 
selenate form. So it's going to have broken off that bond to that hydrogen. So it's going to be the easiest to deprotonate. Um, and then it's going to be the least likely to act as a base to take a proton back because when we have the selenate, well, we have a negative charge and we have it really spread out. And so a reason why this hydroxylate is less likely to form, why it's harder to deprotonate a serine is because in the case of a serine, you have this small, smallish atom that basically you have a negative charge that's going to be really concentrated. And so although the oxygen likes having eight electrons, it doesn't like having that negative charge. And so if something has like a concentrated negative charge, that's going to make it unhappy. And if something is able to spread out that charge, it's going to be happier. And so you can see that thiolate is going to be easier to form than and hydroxylate, but selenate is going to be easier to form than both of these. And when it forms, it's less likely to like unform. It's less likely to act as a base and deprotonate. And so unlikely, uh, so much less likely that we actually see several differences, um, like three pKH unit peak units of the pK two, a difference of like three in the pKa. And so what this is telling us is the pKa is the pH at which half of it is going to be protonated and half of it is going to be deprotonated. So pH is the measure of how many protons are available. And it's an inverse log scale. So basically the more protons you have, the lower the pH, the more acidic. The fewer protons you have, the higher the pH and the more basic. And so if you are below the pKa, there's going to be more protons available than you would like need in order for half of it to be protonated. And if you're above the pKa, then you're going to have fewer protons available than you would like need in order for half of it to be protonated at like equilibrium when you let these molecules like hang out and then at a certain pH and then you go and you look and see how many are protonated and how many are deprotonated. Well, now it's going to depend on at that pH is going to depend on how strong of an acid it is. So how likely, how much does it want to give up that proton? And so in the case of a stronger acid, you have a lower pKa. It, even if there's more protons around, it'll still be deprotonated. And in the case of this selenocysteine, we're almost always going to find it in, or mostly in our bodies, we'll find it in the selenate state because we're about two units by the pKa. So that would be like one in a hundred would be would be protonated and the rest would be deprotonated um, and more in pKa and other posts. But bottom line is that you're often going to find the selenocysteine with its selenate. Now, why does this matter? Well, this is going to make it more reactive as a nucleophile. And so a nucleophile is going to be something that has more electrons or electron density than it wants. And so it's going to seek out something to share that elect those electrons with. Um, and so we call it a nucleophile because, well, it's seeking out something positive um, to share that negativity with and the positive, whereas positivity in an atom is in the nucleus where those protons are. So a nucleophile will seek out and attack an electrophile. And when it does this, it can form bonds. It can also like steal and attack and take a proton. And then we call that acting as a base. And so that's what we were talking about a second ago, how selenium doesn't really like to act as a base that much. It's more acidic. But it's more likely to act as a nucleophile. And so when something acts as like a nucleophile, we typically think about it attacking some other electrophile and this allows it to form new bonds. And so we're going to see that often we get this like substitution reaction where we have a nucleophile, it's going to attack an electrophile. You get this intermediate where that electrophile, so that thing that wants more electrons is kind of like bound by too many things. And so something gets kicked off, that thing that gets kicked off is going to be your leaving group. And so selenium is able to act as a good nucleophile because, well, it's able to, it has those looser held electrons that are more reactive and those because they're farther away. And it's also going to be in that negative charge state typically. And so this is going to make it more reactive. So for, for um, serine and cysteine, we can get them to act as nucleophiles, but typically it's in some sort of, in some context where you have to really, really bribe that proton to leave. Um, with like neighboring amino acids and stuff. Um, but the case of selenocysteine, well, it's normally in its negative charge form, it's all ready to go. And so it can go and it can attack an electrophile. Um, and then selenocysteine also is able to serve as a good leaving group. So it's able to get kicked off and be happy by itself.
Um, and so in order for this reaction to actually like go forward in the direction that you want, the thing, the leaving group has to actually, that you want actually has to be like willing to leave. And so it has to be happy by itself. And in the case of selenia, selenocysteine, well, remember, like we talked about how it kind of like is happy no, no matter what. It's not like, it's kind of okay with having a proton. It's kind of okay with not having a proton. It's okay, electrons, not electrons. It's got that big cloud. It realizes these things. It doesn't sense the difference as much kind of. Um, and so you'll have the selenocysteine. It'll be happy even as a leaving group. And so this is how you're going to be able to then like attack the selenium um, or attack this thing attached to as a selenium in order to kick that selenium off and help give selenium its, um, its reactivity. And this is going to happen much more easily than in the case of a serine or in the case of a cysteine. And this is going to come in really useful because it's going to allow us to break up cysteine, bonds between cysteines. Um, and so we can talk about cysteine, cysteine bonds, um, these disulfide bonds, and as you call these like um, cro cross links, but there are other types of cross links as well. What can happen is that reactive oxygen species, they can basically, um, through intermediates typically, you get the cysteine to form these cross links. And then what happens is that you can have, you can break up these cross links using things with cysteines or using things with seleno, seleno um, cysteines. And when you do it with seleno cysteines, well, that's going to be easier to break back up. And so we see proteins like thyroredoxin be used in order to take their selenium um, selenocysteines and break up disulfide bonds. Now, I've been kind of skirting around this concept of redox, reduction and oxidation. So when we talk about reduction um, and oxidation or redox, we can remember the mnemonic oil rig. So oxidation is loss of electrons or electron density, and reduction is gain of electrons or electron density. And I'm talking in terms of electron density because basically what happens is that when these electrons are sharing, um, when these atoms are sharing electrons to form bonds, they might not share them fairly. So we've mentioned before about electronegativity um, and how some atoms are more hoggy of the electrons they share, they um, they hold. This is true for the electrons they kind of like own themselves as well as the electrons that they get from these shared bonds. And so if you form a bond to something that's more electronegative, well, now you're going to have um, kind of get more, you're going to kind of steal more of the electron density than that other atom gets. This is how we get like partial positive and partial negatives. Um, we get polar molecules and things like that. As a consequence, we also can say that the thing has been oxidized if it kind of gets a bigger share of the electrons that it's sharing. And so we often see that like if something is bound to an oxygen, it gets oxidized, not because it's bound to an oxygen. Like if the oxidation doesn't refer to being bound to an oxygen. It just happens that a lot of times oxidation involves bonds to oxygen because oxygen is really electronegative. And oxidation is loss of electrons. So if something gets oxidized, if it forms a bond to oxygen, well, that gets oxidized because it's losing electrons, because basically the oxygen is going to be stealing those, those electrons that it's sharing. It's kind of hogging them more. Whereas if you were to form a bond to like a hydrogen, well, now you'd be getting reduced. You'd be lose, you'd be gaining electrons um, because you kind of like gaining electron density, the electrons in the shared orbital, like they are shared electrons are going to be hanging out more around you. So it's kind of like you've gained electrons. Electrons. And so we can get all formal about oxidation and reduction numbers and things like this. But bottom line is that cysteine in its sulfhydryl form, in its thio form, this is going to be its most reduced state. And then it can get oxidized. It can get oxidized by like adding oxygen groups, giving you like different acids. And it can also get oxidized by forming these cysteine um, crosslinks. So basically, if you're bound to a hydrogen, remember that's like you're in the most reduced state. If you're bound to another sulfur, well, sulfur is more electronegative than hydrogen. And so you're going to have to share more electrons. And so it's you're being oxidized. And then the selenocysteine is able to help break it up. Um, the selenocysteine is not the only way that you can break off these bonds. Um, and so often we, our cells use glutathione as a sort of redox buffer. Um, and so to kind of maintain keep control over the amounts of oxidating species. So things that can basically oxidize things. Um, so glutathione is kind of like, it can take the hit for, take the hit for the team. Um, so glutathione can exist in this um, free form, this reduced form or this oxidized form where two of them kind of link up through these disulfide bonds. 
Um, and so you see glutathione as kind of serving as a buffering system in your cells. Um, but if that doesn't go right and you get some link you want to get off, well, now selenocysteine can help you with that. Um, because those bonds are going to be easier to break. In addition to glutathione kind of serving as a redox buffer, glutathione peroxidase, it uses glutathione. Um, so instead of having just like free glutathione, it can actually use glutathione to reduce itself after it takes the damage from hydrogen peroxide. And so I mentioned more on this earlier, um, but basically it can get oxidized by hydrogen peroxide um, and then get back reduced um, from glutathione. Um, and yeah, so he, this is a really great review article on some of the different uses for selenoproteins and some of like what makes selenium really good. Um, so it gets really into the details about various things. Um, I highly recommend it if you want to really go into things. Um, but here's just some examples of how it can act in reactions. So we talked about having those kind of like four main groups. You've got the glutathione peroxidase, the iodine thyronine diiodinase, um, thioredoxin reductases, and methionine sulfoxide reductase. And note that like some of these are like families of enzymes and not all of them use selenoproteins or these are selenoproteins. But this is the one we just looked at, this glutathione peroxidase. Um, and so you can see that you have the selenium that's kind of going to um, attack this hydrogen peroxide before the hydrogen peroxide can break up in that way that's gonna give you those free radicals or those um, molecules with the loaned electrons that are gonna be really reactive because electrons like to hang out in pairs. Um, and so basically you have that in this enzyme, so this would be a glutathione peroxidase, it's going to then break up, it's going to attack that hydrogen peroxide, break that, um, give you water, um, and then glutathione is going to then come in it's going to break that bond um, to the water, and then it's going it's going to attack the selenium because, and then the water is going to come off, and then another glutathione is going to come and attack that glutathione, and then you get the selenium come off, um, and then so you've regenerated your seleno, um, you regenerated your glutathione peroxidase, you've neutralized the hydrogen peroxide, and now you just need to reduce back this glutathione. I'm using like a glutathione reductase, which is going to use like NADPH and stuff. Um, you have iodothyronine di diiodinase. Um, you can see that it's going to be taking an iodine from this, um, from this, in order to help make this compound or break this compound. Um, I'm not exactly sure which direction things are going in. So then you have thioredoxin reductases. So basically, in a protein, when you have a disulfide bond that you want to break up, thioredoxin is able to break it up, and it's able to break it up using um, sulfurs of thiol groups. But then you need to break that up. You need to break, someone has to, someone has to regenerate the thyroidoxin. And so this role is played by thyroidoxin reductases. And so what they're going to do is they're going to attack um, that disulfide bond, the sulfur of the disulfide bond, and break it up. Um, and then they have a, so they have a selenium and a sulfur on the, on, in this enzyme, this thyroidoxin reductase. And so the selenium is going to attack the disulfide bonds and break that off, reducing this. But then you have selenium stuck here. And so what's gonna happen is that the sulfur on the thyroidoxin reductase is going to then attack the selenium and you get this kind of linked product um, where you have this selenyl sulfur um, cross-link, um, but then you have this um, in this protein so that it needs to get regenerated, but you've regenerated your thyroidoxin, which can then go and act to reduce those disulfide bonds or break those up. And then you have methionine sulfide reductase, um, which is able to um, remove the oxidative, remove oxidation um, from methionine. So methionine is the other protein, um, the other amino acid that has sulfur and it can't form these like crosslinks and stuff like cysteine can, but it can get oxidized. And when you don't want your methionine oxidized, well, now you have this um, methionine sulfoxide reductase, which can kind of remove that, um, remove that damage. And it's able to do this because you have this selenium. And the selenium is going to be reactive and able to react with this, and then it's going to be able to get broken off. Um, and so all this is taking advantage of selenium's unique properties. So to review, selenocysteine is a super duper cool amino acid, and it's so super cool that you have to go through a lot of work to actually get it put into proteins. Um, and so it goes through this sneaky route where it's instead it takes the right where it has this special part of its RNA in its three prime untranslated region called the cesis element that's going to basically 
keep sequestered nearby a um, by a tRNA that's loaded with selenocysteine. And then when the ribosome reaches what a UGA, which is normally a stop codon, the ribosome is going to be, but while the ribosome pauses to put get the release factor, this is going to be able to sneak in the selenocysteine. And then in order to actually get the selenocysteine on the tRNA, we have to go through all this different um, complex pathway in order to like load it with the serine and then phosphorylate that and then swap the oxygen for um, selenium. So this whole process in order to make this protein, and we only have like 25 or so that actually seleniproteins in our body. So it's a good thing because it takes a lot of work, but it takes a lot of work because selenium is so powerful that we need to really control it well and use it wisely. Um, so selenium, it has these big electron clouds. Um, it's able to give and take proton. It's able to um, give and take electrons more easily. So it can serve in like redox roles. Um, as well as it makes looser bond, weaker bonds, less like overlap and stuff. So you form weaker bonds. You form these bonds more easily though, because the things on the outside, they're going to be like more reactive. Um, they're less kind of held, they're less reined in by the nucleus. They're going to be more reactive. They're going to be less surrounded by water, um, less hidden by water. So they can react more. Um, and But then when they do react, they are more likely to like unreact. So go kind of go back and forth between um, being bonded and not bonded to different things, um, which makes them really useful for helping um, when you want kind of reversible bonds. Um, and so in addition to helping like break up unwanted crosslinks, it can do things like serve as a sensor for reactive oxygen species um, because it can like get oxidized and form new bonds and then get reduced and break these bonds. And so basically it does a lot of really cool stuff, um, but it is going to take a lot of work in order to get that to get that. A final um, note just about some of the history. Um, so selenium itself was discovered in 1817 by the Swedish chemist Johns Jacob Berzelius. Um, he found it in a sulfuric acid factory. Um, so yeah, so that must have smelled really awful, but he named it selenium after the group moon goddess Selene. Um, so although selenocysteine isn't essential in the dietary sense because our bodies can make it ourselves the selenium actually is so we need the selenium from our diet so it's the only amino acid that requires an essential dietary micronutrient as to what we know about selenium and proteins a lot of that comes from the work of the late Theresa Stratman um, so basically in the 1970s she discovered selenocysteine and proteins and did a lot of research on them um, so we have her to thank and that is that for today's post on selenocysteine and we covered a lot. Hope it was helpful and selenoproteins, um, they're pretty cool. So keep an eye out for them.